you, Bradley, for your help and leadership. He's one of our leaders of chain breakers. What's up, church? Uh, we'll just begin with a word of prayer this morning. Father God, we thank you so much, and we just invite you into this space with us, Lord. Father, we just we need you today. We love you, and we praise you, Lord. Father God, I'm just asking just to get me out of the way. Just uh, let these people leave here uh, forgetting me but remembering you, Lord. Father God, just uh, speak through me. Use me as a vessel. Father God, I come against any stuttering or misreading words or anything that uh, would hinder my message today, Lord. Father, we thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. All right. So before I begin, I would like to glorify the name of God. He is so good to us. We are undeserving of his love, his grace, and his mercy, but through it all, he loves us anyway. There is not a star in the night sky that is there for any other reason other than he wanted it to be there. Believe me when I tell you that we serve an awesome God. And without his intervention in my life, I would be long gone. But he had other plans for me. I am so grateful to be his child and to be living in his will today. My name is Bradley, and I'm simply a sinner saved by grace. I currently serve here as the men's leader of Chain Breakers. And uh, Chain Breakers Ministry, we meet every Wednesday night here at the church. The majority of our group come in here battling drug addiction, alcoholism, criminal behavior, depression, guilt, shame. But the thing is, we do not limit, limit our ministry to recovery. Men and women walk into our meeting on the belief that whatever life has thrown at them, whatever chains have bound them, Jesus Christ can and will restore them to the person God created them to be. As many of you know, I've been coming to Spirit of Grace for over two years. And in that time, I have grown not only in my sobriety, but in my faith. Now I'm a recovering alcoholic and meth addict. Prior to surrendering my life to Christ, I was a homeless needle junkie and I was living in sin. In the last few years, it's taken hard work, it's taken willingness and obedience, and above all, I needed God, because without him, it wasn't going to happen. And I have spent Sunday morning, week after week, at this altar, literally crying my eyes out, bawling out of control, because I know that I have been saved. You guys come in, you see me, I stand right here, and... Some of the things that Trish says between songs, it's just speaking directly to my heart. And I know that I have a God out there who cares about me. I have a God that loves me. And I have a God who is never going to forsake me. And it took me a while to know that, you know, I was the one who stepped away from God. He never stepped away from me. He was always there for me. Through my garbage and through everything that I was doing, God was still there for me. You know, you, you, you act like you, uh, you step away from it, you start walking in sin, and uh, you get away from what, what God has for you, but he was there that whole time. Every time I stuck a needle in my arm, he was there making sure I didn't overdose. Every time I stepped into the wrong trap house, he was there making sure I didn't get shot. He was there for me the whole time. And in, the, in my time in this ministry, I've seen miracles. I have seen families restored. I have seen people redeemed and made new. And in Jesus' name, I have seen the dead be brought back to life. I have seen my nephew here, shouldn't have been born. If you, if you listen to science and you listen to doctors, he didn't have a chance. But our God is greater. Our God is bigger, and our God can heal, and he can restore, and he can move mountains. But you just got to let him. You know, and then I look back at the situation with Cassie, you know, and, you know, I didn't know her, you know, but I prayed for her and we joined into this, this symphony of prayer, this prayer campaign, and I joined every other ministry that I'm a part of. We got in on this, you know, and like, you know, like they said, we shook the kingdom. We brought this petition to the Lord and we said, Lord, please don't let her die. And she didn't. And then uh, like uh, just, a, just a week ago, I, me and a coworker had to rescue a guy who was overdosing in the bathroom of our thrift store. You know, and I screamed out and I said, in Jesus' name, you're going to live. In Jesus' name, wake up. God wasn't done with him. And I, and I have been praying and I've been hoping that this man will find his way to our program or he'll find his way somewhere that's going to save him. And, you know, if that's God's will, that will be his will. And, you know, I, hopefully I can help this man. 
But I can tell you one thing. Through all of that, I have to stay as desperate as I was on day one. Because if I get too comfortable, I will start to forget that it was God who got me here in the first place. I remember one day I stood at this altar, and for some reason, some days, no matter how much I've seen or experienced, my flesh still asks for spiritual confirmation. So God gave me a vision, a flashback, if you will. He brought me back several years, brought me back to that place where I was homeless and I was high and drunk and just walking around with nowhere to go. No one wanted anything to do with me, and I deserved it. I had done such a good job of screwing my life up that no one wanted anything to do with me. And I remembered how lonely I was and how lost I was. And right there, Jesus told me, take a look around this sanctuary. And I realized how blessed I actually was and how many people in this room love me. And I am absolutely blessed to have them. And how everyone in here I have a personal connection with. And you all are a gift from God. Thank you for that. I spent the entire time I was in rehab praying to God to deliver me from my drug and alcohol addiction. I spent countless hours in meetings and in classes praying that if I could just have that removed from me, everything would be all right. And then God led me to Dave Johnson, who led me to Spirit of Grace. He led me to a place where I could experience worship on another level. And, and can you guys attest to that? It is different here. It, this, this is not church as usual. And uh, one, one downside to Spirit of Grace is it has desensitized me and it's made every other church just dry to me you know and that's that's all right though because this is my home he led me here to my church family where I was going to experience spiritual growth on a whole nother level little did I know this church was praying for me long before I got here little did I know this church was creating space for me and my family this role right here this is what you guys were praying for two years ago. Little did I know it was God who ordained the chain of events that led to the ripple effect that ended up bringing my sister to the Lord and planted the seeds for her kids to be raised in the truth of the Lord. He set forth a path for restoration to happen in her house. Little did I know that my faith would grow and my Lord would ordain my steps to be elevated in my job. The job I have now is, was my dream job two years ago. That's what God can do for you. Believe me, I never thought I would ever be good enough for someone to trust me to manage their rehab center. But God will take your, our shortcomings and he will redeem them. Nothing is impossible when you trust in God. He's not, he not only promises life, but he promises life abundantly. It, was, it, it wasn't as simple as God delivering me from my addiction. One of the most important things God taught me through Spirit of Grace and through Pastor Tim is God wasn't just looking to deliver me from my life of drug addiction and homelessness and sin and shame. He was looking to deliver me out of those things and into something bigger. Because believe me, you can get sober and still be stuck. How many people have gotten sober, but they're still living in that shame? They're still living in that guilt? They're still bound up by those chains that God is looking to break. You can eliminate your major problem and still be bound up. God wasn't looking to just get me clean because on my own understanding, getting sober was my ceiling I had set for myself. But God said, child, there are higher heights. And I am going to equip you and strengthen you to reach bigger and better. As many of you know, I work for the Salvation Army, and I am blessed to have church before church every Sunday. And I'll explain. Um, so 8.30, every Sunday morning, we have chapel service for the men who are in the program and for their families to come. And uh, we bring the word of God. We throw a little bit of recovery in there. Um, we have praise and worship. And... Uh, yeah, and then we have an altar call. It's, it's a very beautiful service, and I've had some of my most spiritual experiences there. But like I said, I'm dry compared to this. <laughs> and it's an opportunity to serve the Lord as a vocalist on the worship team. That's right, I sing. <laughs> I get to sing the praises to our Lord Jesus, who is just so, so good to us. And he has also given me the opportunity to read scripture or pray over the offering. And once in a while, I've been given the honor and the privilege to bring the message. God allows me to preach his truth and his gospel over the men in our program, and I am honored to serve him. For the longest time, 
I was convinced that I came to, to church Sunday morning at the Salvation Army to serve, but I would come to Spirit of Grace simply to worship. And I was blessed to be part of this body of believers. However, little did I know that God was preparing a way for me to serve this church. Believe me when I tell you again that God will take your shortcomings and he will redeem them. I spent Sunday after Sunday breaking down at this altar and Wednesday after Wednesday attending chain breakers, growing in my spirituality. But little did I know I was being observed by another humble servant of the Lord. Nicole approached me and asked me if I wanted to be the men's leader of chain breakers and without hesitation I said yes. Now part of me was thinking, you have more service commitments right now than you know what to do with. What, what are you thinking? But when God says go, you go. When God says jump, you say how high will you allow me to jump? He sometimes put a call, puts a calling on your life that even though you are not sure of, you will end up seeing why they call him the way maker. Now I thought I just had a drug problem, but no. I found out I was also depressed, I had no confidence, I felt sorry for myself, I had a bunch of spiritual problems. Drug addiction and alcoholism was my demon, but my spiritual problems were the shackles and the chains that I allowed that demon to bind me with. I remember when I first started preaching, I brought a very simple but blunt message, and that is this. Recovery is life or death. You can either live for the glory of God, or you can drink yourself to death. Plain and simple. Now, I've spent two and a half years in recovery trying to get my act together. And believe me when I tell you, people who I have met people who think they have all the answers. I have spent nights pouring my heart out in AA clubs to receiving healing and deliverance, and I have met people who will tell you that if you don't work the 12 steps and work them thoroughly, you are bound to drink, which is true. The 12 steps are crucial and they are brilliant. I have met born again believers who will swear blind that once you go down in the waters of baptism, you are, you're purified which is true. You absolutely are a new creation when you go down in the waters of baptism, but the willingness and the obedience to God is still up to you. I used to wonder how people could relapse after giving their life to Jesus, and it's simple. They took their will back. The things they were supposed to leave under the water, they picked back up. So after searching for the answer on exactly what I was going to need to do to achieve long-term sobriety, I seen the answer was so simple and it was there all along. And in that, God gave me a new message. God gives us strength. You guys might see I post that on Facebook a lot, you know, because I have experienced that and that's, that is the truth right there. On my own, I was absolutely powerless. I was outnumbered and outgunned. On my own will, I was hopeless and everything I have accomplished in the last two years was nothing short of God's grace and mercy. I needed a drastic change in my life and God gave me the strength to do it. Some days are downright hard and I have to start every day saying, Lord, I thank you so much for waking me up in my right mind today. I thank you that I am walking on my own two feet today. I say, Lord, please guide my thinking and my actions and please make me more Christ-like. And Lord, please give me the strength to live today. And sometimes that's all, that's all we need is just the strength to make it through today. Some days I battle all day not only my demons, but my flesh and my depression. And I don't know how I'm going to make it, but I stay in prayer. Some nights I'll pray right before God puts me to bed, and I will just barely have made it. But in Jesus' name, I made it. Because God gave me the strength to do it. Whatever your demon is, I'm here to tell you today that we serve a God who loves you. A God who cares, and no matter what you are going through, it's not too much for him. Whatever chains that you need broken, our Jesus can break them. I invite you to stand in the mighty name of Jesus. <clears throat> so there's a song, and uh, if you know the words, you can sing along. It goes, I will call upon the Lord, for he alone is strong enough to save. Rise, your shackles are no more. For Jesus Christ has broken every chain. 
Jesus name will break every stronghold freedom is ours when we call his name Jesus name above every other all hail the power of Jesus name let's pray Gracious, wonderful, heavenly Father, I thank you so much just for the opportunity to get up here and uh, audition myself for the band. Um, Lord, Lord God, uh, I, th I thank you so much for that if I was able to speak to anybody or speak life into them, that that came from you and not from me, Lord. Father God, I thank you so much for Chain Breakers. I thank you for Spirit of Grace, Lord. Father God, I thank you just for... Uh, the lives that have been changed here, I thank you that you've just given us new life. You breathe that new life into us, Lord God. Father, I thank you for everything that you're doing in our lives, Lord. We just give you all the honor and all the glory and all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Awesome, awesome. Very good. We love you. Amen, amen. Praise God. My week has been made. I just got to tell you, I'm so godly proud of Nicole and Bradley, what they've done and what they've spoken last night and today in Jesus' name. You can be seated. Uh, thank you so much for that. And you need to write this down, Spirit of Grace members. He's the first preacher that got done exactly when he was supposed to get done. It's 8.59. <laughs> he was a minute early. Praise God. That was awesome. And uh, I appreciated those words so strongly because uh, I've shared this a little bit, but about 25 years ago, the Lord laid the burden of chain breaker ministry on my shoulders, and I didn't understand why or how it was going to happen. But we have been praying for those that are newer that the sanctuary was we created the space in order to prepare a place for people to find the Lord and uh, we believe very strongly in the restoration of God's spirit in us I believe that God created each one of us for a reason and for a purpose and so our our desire is that that purpose would be fulfilled in everybody's life and so to hear Bradley say that, it, uh, it excites my spirit. Praise God. I'm thankful for this weekend. It's been in the works for a while. And uh, we'll learn some things as far as function of this conference and change it for the next one and improve it each time we do it. But uh, at this time, Jason's going to pass out uh, a booklet for you to take home. Um, and... Uh, I think we've got enough for everybody, Jason, so go ahead and just pass them out. Um, in each one of these, uh, you can follow along. Um, we've got note outline in there, and you can take your own notes as we present the information. Um, I've, I've got the outline for you, and I've got some paper, and then in the back of this, the last four or five pages of that booklet is two things it's a scripture reference because if we read all the scripture that we're going to reference today we'll be here all day reading the scriptures so you can go at another time and then also you'll find three or four pages at the end of it um, that have all the resources from the information that we've gathered today and so um, I encourage you to take as many notes as you can uh, we are recording this, so hopefully, you know, in the near future, we'll have it on our Facebook, not on our Facebook, on our YouTube channel, and uh, access through our website. But we want to, you can see the title of all of this is Overcoming Toxic Thoughts. I believe very strongly, uh, more and more, that if we understand the principle of our thought patterns or our thoughts, we would understand the things of God more because um, as we preached last night, it is our thoughts that is the primary battlefield that 
we are a part of. And uh, so today what we're going to do, I'm going to give you our introduction to all of this, and we're going to deal with the first lie, and then we're going to take a break, and then my wife's going to come, and she's going to take two sessions and deal with lie two, three, four, and five, and then I'm going to come back and deal with lie six and seven and close it, and we're going to eat. But <laughs> glad you're excited. And uh, so with this, what our agenda is or what our goal is, is that we would be able to take the things that we share with you today and it becomes part of your lifelong journey. This is not something that you can get done. We're not, we're not teaching a magic pill that you can take and all of a sudden all your thoughts are good and everything is hunky-dory. This is a lifelong journey that all of us are going to have to fight through. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10.5 lets us know that uh, to take every thought captive to obey Christ. Paul says that because he understood probably more than any of the other writers of the New Testament that the battle was in our, it was in our brains. It was in our, it was in, it's in our minds. And, and, and we, we dealt with some of that last night. But what we can't see... Our thoughts. We can't see our thoughts. But if you really pay attention, you'll realize that your thoughts control so much of who we are. And so it determines a lot of times how we feel, what we do, what we say or we don't say. It dictates how we move or how we sleep. Inform, it informs us to what we want. It... Uh, dictates what we love and what we hate. In other words, how we think shapes our life. And when you understand that, that that's nice to be able to say, I, yeah, my, light, my thoughts will dictate, yeah, that makes sense. But how little we pay attention to those thoughts uh, is really mind-blowing. And... Uh, did you get it yet? <laughs> oh, I love you, Travis. He's been trying to get that chair turned around. But what our, thought, our thoughts do is it creates in us a determinate action that we become. Okay, and so what we're going to talk about is if our thoughts... It's the reason why Paul wrote to the Romans to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He also said it in Ephesians, to be transformed by your, the renewing of your mind as well. Uh, we read that in, in chapter 4 of Ephesians last night. And so here's what happens is, uh, and we'll give you some numbers here as we go along, but we grab a thought out of all the thousands of thoughts that we have every day, and we begin to dwell on certain thoughts. And those thoughts become part of our process and become part of our action. And it becomes a pattern of life. There is, according to, uh, and I don't know who this is, but it's JAMA, J-A-M-A, -A, internal, internal Medicine. Um, they came out with a study a, a while ago, but an estimated 60 to 80% of visits to primary care physicians has to do with stress relation or stress related components okay now stress is all about the mind it's how you think about it. you stew things you you go over things that begins to stress you and 60 to 80 percent of primary visits uh, to care facilities are have to do with that uh, Dr. Caroline Leaf said this, 75 to 98% of mental, physical, and behavioral illness comes from one's thought life. Think of that, 75 to 98% of all your illnesses. Now we say, well, we have high blood pressure. Well, how did that high blood pressure start? Probably because you stressed yourself out by the way you thought. 75 to 98, that, those numbers are mind-blowing. Now, in Scripture, when you hear the word heart, it, it's really talking about the soul. Heart and soul are interchangeable terms for the most part in Scripture. And in the 
the heart or the soul is the seed of the mind, the will, and the emotions. And we dealt with that a little bit last night. But I bring that up to say this. Um, you could say then, if the heart and the soul is the mind, the will, and the emotions, you can say that the, the soul and the heart is the same as the brain, right? Because it's in our brains where we do our thinking. It's from our brain. We say it's from our heart. We love you with all of our heart, okay? Now, I wouldn't suggest husbands or wives to go home and say, honey, I love you with all of that beating organ that's pumping blood through my body. It probably doesn't go over as well. Okay, so when we talk about the heart, we're not talking about that organ that's pumping the blood through. We're talking about how we think and how we feel and how, uh, what our will is. That, that's the heart. That's the soul. That's the brain, if you will. And within our brain are those three main functions of body, soul, or, or mind, uh, will, and emotions. And so here's what happens, and, and, and I won't ask for a raise of hands, but... Um, all people have this same pattern just at different frequencies. But if you just recognize this, this is the pattern that a lot of us get into. Uh, we surrender to God. We get excited about the things of the Lord, and we have a big smile on our face, and everything is good. And it does that for a few days, maybe even a couple of weeks, maybe even several years, until something falls into our pathway that trips us up, and we grab another thought that's negative, and all of a sudden, everything that was good that was going on shifts. And for some of us, that pattern happens all the time, some of us, it takes longer. I've had a friend of mine that, that uh, it was almost a weekly basis where he would get on fire for God and life would be good and, and things would be going smooth and then something would happen and he was in the doldrums of life because his thought pattern, his cycle, if you will, of the pattern of thought uh, got to that cycle where, okay, it's down here now and it's up there. Now. And for all of us, it doesn't matter who we are or how old, we go through that cycle of taking that thought and it t triggers us to begin what we will use today as the downward spiral or the upward spiral. And so uh, we all do this. And so the goal today is to give us a tool that will break that cycle that will break that pattern of, uh, of getting excited about life, of things going well, and, and you're, you're on cloud nine, and, and you're excited about the blessings of God, and then two days later, you're wondering which way is up and where God disappeared to, and why does the dog not even love me anymore? Okay? And, and we want to get something in your hands today and in your thought process to break that cycle. Because whether we realize it or not, science has shown that our brain is constantly changing, whether we realize it or intend for it to. And, and, and so our patterns within our brain or our downward spiral, it usually starts with a random thought or an emotion. So sometimes it's a random thought. Sometimes it's like an anger. You've been hurt by somebody. Something has happened to you, and you feel that emotion. And that emotion then triggers more thought, and you begin to think about that. And all of a sudden, as you think about that, that leads to certain behaviors. Okay? And those behaviors affect the relationships that we have. And after that, we deal with the consequences of this downward spiral of thought. Okay, and so the key is to understand where your spiral really starts from. Majority of time, it starts from your emotions. And the problem with emotions, while they are real and can be good, and we, we're all emotional at some level, the problem with emotions is emotions dwell or are based on perceived circumstances. Okay, it, it, it's, let me put it to you this way. John Owen said it this way. He said, be killing sin or it will be killing you. Okay, because what ends up happening is 
you end up being absorbed by that downward spiral and you can't get out of it if you don't think about it, okay? And we talked a little bit about that last night. We're the thinker, not the thought. So the average person, Nicole mentioned this last night, the average person has more than 30,000 thoughts per day, and so many of these thoughts are negative. And, and when I say negative today, I'm not just talking about bad thoughts. I'm talking about natural thoughts, okay? Thoughts that come from a carnal place, a human understanding place, not a spiritual godly place, okay? So sometimes it, it sometimes... You know, our, our, some of our good thoughts can be negative, okay? How many like to get a raise at work, okay? How many understand that it's not always God giving you the raise, okay? So if we get excited about the raise, that may still be a carnal thought because we like the raise, but we haven't taken the time to process whether or not God was blessing us or the enemy was trying to trap us. Because sometimes raises carry with it other concepts or other responsibilities and duties that take us away from what God is leading us to. Does that make sense? So when we say negative, I'm not talking as just bad thoughts, although that applies obviously, but just human thoughts, carnal thoughts. Okay? Uh, again, Dr. Leaf said this, according to researchers, the vast majority of the illnesses that plague us today are a direct result of a toxic thought life. Okay, these are not people, these are not preachers. Okay, these are not people that are explaining the word. These are scientists, these are doctors. They have done the studies, they have done the researches, and they have realized that a great correlation of sickness, disease, uh, troubles, mental disorders, all of that stem from toxic thoughts. And so the question comes, since God created us, there has to be a mechanism, there has to be a key that can break those patterns of thinking. And there's one beautiful, powerful thought that could shift the chaotic nature or pattern of your life for the better every time you think about it. Okay, and that's what we're going to be discussing here today because the greatest battle of our generation is being taught between our ears. And I'll give you that, that one thing here in just a couple of minutes. Now, I said that we're going to talk about seven lies today. And in those seven lies, you can, it's just kind of like a subheading. Okay, so I'm going to give a specific lie, but the principle of the lie really fills all kinds of uh, situations. And in the midst of that, all seven lies that we tell ourselves generally fall into one of three things, one of three baskets, if you will, or buckets. Number one, I'm helpless. How many have ever felt helpless? Number two, I'm worthless. And number three, I'm unlovable. Helpless, worthless, unlovable. And these lies shape our thinking. They shape our emotions. They shape the way we respond to the world around us. They trap us in the cycle of distraction and distortion and pain, and they prevent us from recognizing the truth that we should believe. And they change how we view God. I'll say that again. They change how we view God. So I asked the question, how many have ever felt helpless? And just about every hand was raised, okay? Because all of that helplessness is a lie because you've never been helpless. Well, pastor, you don't know where I've been. Yeah, but here's the problem with, I'm not going to argue with my own thing, but the Bible says this, that God is an ever-present help in time of trouble. You've never been helpless. Now, you have felt it. And because you thought you were helpless, it caused all kinds of problems and situations. But in all actuality, you have never been helpless because he is an ever-present help in the time of need. That's in the book of Psalms. 
So there's never been a day where you've been helpless. It's a lie that we swallow and we think about, and it causes toxicity in us to where we actually stop thinking that God is actually there to help. Okay? So when I say, has anybody been helpless before, and we raise our hands, it's because we have removed God from the picture, even though God's word says he's always there, and he's an ever-present time. Worthless. Okay? Okay? We've all felt worthless before, but that's because we haven't taken God for his, at his word. His word says that we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, 1 Peter 2.9. That word peculiar doesn't mean weird. It may apply, but it doesn't mean that. That word peculiar means that God has placed a circle around you and identified you as his. Now, if the creator of the universe will draw a circle around us and claim that we are his, that means we have some worth. But because of the way we think, based off of the emotion that we feel, and we get in this downward spiral because some lunatic told you that you were worthless because they haven't recognized God. And now we're feeling worthless because we're not recognizing God because our thoughts have become toxic. You see what I'm saying? And then obviously unlovable. Well, okay, the main scripture that everybody seems to know. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe on him. Okay, if he loved us enough to come and die for us, I'd say we're lovable. Now, you may not think the person sitting next to you is very lovable at the moment, but they're lovable. Because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. He loves us so much. So while each one of those emotions are valid, because emotions are valid, whether they're good, bad, or ugly, they're valid emotions, you have them. But when it comes to the thought that's attached with the motion, you have something in you that God placed in you that will allow you to reject the emotion and live in the truth, okay? And, and so um, every lie that we buy about ourselves is rooted in the fact of what we believe about God. Now, that's kind of a scary thought. Because all of our crazy thinking is a reflection of what we think about God. Now, don't panic. Okay? Don't freak out. God understands who we are. He created us. He knows the intents. He knows the thoughts and the intents of your heart. His word divides the thoughts and the intents. He knows exactly what's going on, so he understands that he loves you in spite of our shortcomings. Okay, so what ends up happening is that this toxic thinking produces an alternate reality. Okay, one in which is uh, distorted reasoning becomes sensible. Have you ever thought about that? Distorted thinking becomes common sense. It's where we're at in America today. Okay, and, and because of the toxic thinking, we are living and dwelling in an alternate reality and one which is now seems to make sense to some people. How many have ever used this phrase, well, perception is reality? Have you ever used that or thought about it or had it said to you? It's a lie. Perception is not reality because reality is real. How you perceive it doesn't make it any less real it just means you're wrong or you're right in your perception okay perceived reality it's functional i guess but not true it, it, it's it, it, for instance and i used this last night and it was hilarious to watch some of you married people as i was preaching um but i i said that i made the statement um perceived reality my wife just doesn't love me anymore okay I, I, we've been married, but she just doesn't love me anymore. That's the perceived reality. And once we get that quote-unquote reality, even though it's just a perceived reality, 
our human nature doesn't allow us to just cancel that out. Our human nature then searches for reasons to prove your perceived reality. I, I know of a couple that wanted to get a divorce and walked into the preacher, and the preacher says, well, why do you want to get a divorce? And his response, believe it or not, was this. Well, she didn't bring root beer home from the grocery store. That was it. Can you imagine that that's the reason for a divorce? Obviously, that wasn't the reason, but somewhere in this man's thinking became a thought process that my wife really doesn't love me and her not bringing the root beer was the last proof text that he needed to, to, uh, to, to uh, solidify his perceived reality. And so he wanted, he, he, was, he was done. Okay, do you see what I'm saying? What, what in all actuality is truth is simply that they might not be loving you the way you want to be loved. Their acts of love are not registering with your desire for how you want to be loved in that moment. They're giving love in pesos and we want it in dollars. And we're too, we don't value their pesos and we're too lazy, too busy, or too insensitive to learn the exchange rate. Does that make sense? So the truth or true reality is that you're loved and you're being loved, you just haven't perceived it properly. And your new perception becomes your reality. And that toxic thought just starts a spiral downward. And that's where the majority of marital and relationship issues come is because, and so like when, when we start dealing with ourselves and we start dealing with people in, in counseling, what we're trying to do is get back up here to where it starts. Why did you think that? Why did you go through that? Well, because of this, because of this, because I've, been, I've heard this all my life. And, and because our thoughts become so entrenched in who we are, the expression of all of those thoughts, as toxic as they are, begin to create in us a perceived reality. Here's the exciting part, is that you can change your brain in an instant. Science tells us that our brains are full of neural pathways, some shallow and moldable, moldable and some grooves dug deep from a lifetime of toxic thought. Literally, in our brains, there are neural pathways. There's, there, there's some, are, some are, you know, right now, Coon Rapids Boulevard is all torn up by our house. And we go through the mountains to get to our house now. I mean, we go way down into this rut and we come back. It takes five minutes to cross the intersection right now or we'll mess up the whole bottom of our car. Okay? So, little, but then you drive over another little crack and you can't hardly tell it's there. That's the same thing in our brain. We've got these little cracks or these little neural pathways that we can't even tell that they're really there. But then when we really focus in and think about it, there are some things for most of us, we're all at least 15 and, and above. And so there's at least 15 years of digging the ditch in our brain. And so all of a sudden we get to a place where we recognize and here's the problem, is we think that it's going to be a, a, almost torturous to change that pathway in our brains. But I'm here to tell you that it's not going to be easy. Don't misunderstand me. I told you at the beginning, this isn't going to be a magic thing that you're going to walk out of here and you're going to be thinking great all day. This is something you're going to moment by moment, day by day, a necessary item in your life in order to overcome your toxic thoughts. But they can change. They can change. If our thought lives are the deepest and darkest places of the strongholds within us, all hell will try to stop us from being free from that. It's the reason why I believe, I mentioned this and stated this last night, I believe that every addiction, every uh, situation, every uh, depression, guilt, Shame, loneliness, all of those things 
are not the problem. They are symptoms of a deeper problem. And that deeper problem is always somebody has started to think that way. Because if you stop and thought the correct way, and when I say uh, you, I'm talking to myself today. This stuff has changed my life over the last month. I'm, I'm, I'm fighting this every day myself. So this is not something like I'm not teaching this saying I've got this mastered. Do as I do. Now I'm, I'm saying let's do it together. Okay? But loneliness, if you're really smart about it and think about it, you'll never be lonely if you have a relationship with Jesus because he says I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'm with you all the time, everywhere. But our perceived reality is that, no, we're on our own. Jesus isn't anywhere near. We can't feel him. We can't sense him. He's right there. His word is either true or it's not. Our thoughts are either right or they're not. Okay? And he understands that. So this is not just a strategy, although it's, it can be applied like a strategy. <laughs> tragedy. It can be that too. But a strategy... But what we are presenting to you here in the next, I'm still in my intro for, for, for all of this, is hard work. It's patience. And it's buckets of grace that God gives us. Okay, this isn't just, this isn't, a, a, you know, do A, B, C, and you're done. Okay, this is a lifelong act of work and patience. Um, but we have been equipped by God to do so. 2 Corinthians 10 verses 3 through 6 lets us know that he has equipped us with power to dare, tear down the strongholds in our minds to destroy the lies that dominate our thought part. You're never going to destroy all the lies, but you're going to be able through the help of God to destroy the dominion of those lies. I wish I could tell you that you're never going to hear another lie about yourself between now and eternity, but I'm sorry, there's going to be a lie somewhere along the line. But it doesn't have to take dominion over you. Now, I believe this. I believe that some of what the enemy has done, and maybe God has allowed to happen, I don't know how it all works, but I do believe this. I love technology, and I hate technology. And we're going to deal with this in a little bit. But the instant stuff that our society has embraced the, have caused our lives to become so chaotic. And thus our thought processes become so chaotic. And our lives become so chaotic. And these, this chaos that's going on in our minds uh, lead us to emotions that and sometimes emotions that are wild and they tell us how to behave and the spiral begins to start over again and how we think directly results in how we live and just when we think we got it together uh, Bradley mentioned it this morning the times that he would come and get in the presence of God and, and then you had to constantly think through it again because it keeps coming back up That's what we, and so there is one thought that can interrupt every negative thought pattern and it's simply this I have a choice everybody say that I have a choice you have a choice I have a choice it is the key to understanding your thought life you have a choice. Now you need to activate it. Your choice, if you're having 30,000 uh, thoughts per day and you're grabbing four or five of them, those four or five thoughts that you grab, you have a choice to take it to the next level or to let it die right there. It's your choice. Let me say that again. It's your choice. Don't blame the wife or the husband. Don't blame the kids. Yeah, they may be bouncing off the walls. They may be driving you absolutely crazy. Welcome to parenthood. And for whatever reason, kids bounce off the walls at the most inopportune times. Right? Okay. 
But in the midst of that time, you have the choice what you're going to think about it. And what I pray for myself and for this group is that through the coming days, weeks, and months, as you take what we're sharing here today and you daily try to apply it, that eventually what ends up happening is you stop having to think about it. It's just ingrained in you to make the right choice every time you're dealing with the thought. That's the ultimate goal. And whether we get there or not before Jesus comes, I don't know because we're human. But we do have the choice. Okay? When we become new creatures through the new birth experience, I believe that God gives us the power to interrupt the thought spirals, those downward trends that we tend as humans to lean toward. You and I have a choice. Bradley said it so well. You come up out of that water, but you're still having to deal with your thoughts. Your thoughts are still there. You're still having, and we talked last night about which side of our, uh, of our being are we listening to. Are we listening to that carnal side, or are we listening to the spirit side? We have a choice in interrupting the thought spirals that we tend to lean toward. We have a choice by changing through the power of the Holy Spirit our thought patterns. I I need to emphasize this even greater. It's your choice, not God's. God's going to help you when you make your decision of how you're going to think He swoops in. Good choice, my son. Good choice, my daughter. Here, let me give you some help. But when we make the wrong thought, then he's battling against us, not to fight us, but to change our thinking. Our choice. You see, when we think new thoughts, we physically alter our brains. Think of that. Now, here's the, here's the problem for some of us. When we're newer to having a life found in God, we think that it's just going to change like that, and you're not having to deal with anything from the, the past getting into your thoughts. Uh, sorry. Okay? You didn't get to the place in your life where you needed God overnight. The mess that your old nature created didn't happen overnight. The mess of thoughts that your old life created overnight didn't happen overnight. It was a constant, whenever you came to know the Lord, that up leading up to that, you are now a new creature in Christ, but now you're having to learn how to change the way you think, and it's a growth process. So if you have been serving God for a year, don't expect to have everything in place if you spent 30 years fighting against God. Does that make sense? Okay, so you, you, you physically alter your brains. When you think new thoughts, we make healthier neural connections. Say that a hundred times. That word neural gets me every time. Um, what that means is simply this. How your emotions are expressed when you start thinking in a new way, they're healthier. Your connection between your mind and your emotions become healthier. I have shared this story many times through the years. Uh, Some of you are newer and may have never heard of it. But when I was a kid, uh, there was a lady in our church by the name of Victoria Booker. Victoria Booker had a son named Jim and somewhere through that pregnancy, she contracted something. I don't know, remember even what it was. But for the rest of her life, she was relegated to a bed. She, or she was in pain constantly. When she would come to church, uh, her muscles and, and joints, she, she sat like this in the chair. She was, you know, whatever happened to her, whatever she dealt with. But I remember a lot of times uh, in our church, we had really wide aisles And so they would open up the door and they would just put her hospital bed in the center aisle. And this went on year after year after year after year. Uh, I mean, for years, this is what she dealt with. And my dad, who was a minister of the church, would oftentimes holler at me and say, Tim, let's go visit Sister Booker. We've got to go cheer her up a little bit. And, uh, 
and, and, and visit with her. And so I'm thinking, okay, what are we going to say to this lady who can't get out of bed, who's in constant pain? But we would walk in. It was, happened every time. It happened all the time. We would walk into her room, and she would get this huge smile on her face, and she would say, isn't the Lord good? And as a kid, I'm thinking, you're crazy, lady. You haven't gotten out of bed in years. You're in constant pain. You can't really even feed yourself because your hands don't function properly anymore. You're, you're, you've got this boy that you've been raising, and, and you can't even get down on the floor and play with him and all of those kinds of things. And, and, and I'm thinking, what are you talking about? Well, here's what I'm talking about. She had proper thought process. She made the choice to see the goodness of God instead of the negative of her situation. Was she faking it? No. She wasn't just acting. She wasn't just pretending. She had in her thought process gotten to a place where it doesn't matter how bad life gets, all she thought about was the goodness of God. She fulfilled Philippians chapter 4 that doesn't give us qualifications. It just says think on all of those things. It's the power of the thought. And so because she changed the way she thought, the neural connections between her emotions were healthier than even ours, who we were physically healthy, but there was a connection to her emotions in God because of the way she thought. I never put that together until this last couple of weeks, that it was her, the way she thought. I, I always... You know, in the back of my mind, yeah, that's just how she was. That's how she looked at things. But no, 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 that's, that's how she was thinking. Everything changes for us. Uh, Nicole quoted this last night. Dr. Dan Siegel said this, Where attention goes, neural firing flows and neural connection grows. Patterns you thought were fixed are actually things that with mental effort can indeed be changed. We are not passive in all this activity of mind and awareness. In other words, when Paul said, think on these things in Philippians 4, 8, it wasn't a positive, power of positive thinking uh, seminar, but what Paul understood is that there is power in positive thinking. Because positive thinking lets you see the perceived reality in the proper light. And you begin to recognize. So in the middle of your nightmare of a situation, if you're thinking about the good report and if you're thinking about virtue and if you're thinking about praise and you're thinking about hope and you're thinking about the things of God, all of a sudden that situation becomes very, very small and God becomes very, very big. All based on how you're thinking. So part of that change is to recognize and stop it with the word that says, I... I'm going to choose. Now, in your notes there, you'll see drawing battle, line, battle lines. Uh, I, I just there's there's several things there, um, but I want to just mention one. Proverbs twenty three seven, as he thinks in his heart, so is he. As he thinks in his heart, so is he. Every toxic, spiraling downward downward emotional cycle, is a trap of the enemy that we fall for involves the wrong belief about God. I've mentioned that already. And, and, and so we read it last night in Romans 8. If you follow after the flesh, it'll lead you to death. If you follow after the spirit, to life and peace. And so shifting our minds will, will take us there. Now, I, I want to go in in the next, we're going to get this done in the next eight minutes. Um, lie number one. I want you to turn a couple of pages. You'll see the first page that looks like this the blue, and it'll say session number one, line number one. You see that? Okay. The emotion is discontent. How many have ever become just, every, just everything's on, you're on your ball, they're on my nerves. Okay. And so the lie that we have is simply... I'll feel better or I'll do better if I keep myself distracted. That's the lie. Don't ever, don't ever listen to that lie. Because the truth of the matter is only being with God will satisfy you. That's Psalm 84. 
verse 10. And so the choice, I said we have a choice. So when we start this downward spiral, we have a choice in the thought process to say, no, I will be still with God. Okay? Now this is the hardest, probably the hardest one to come by. The question is this, why is the simplest best thing for my soul, long-term health, so crazy difficult to do? Just to be still with God. Well, I'll tell you, because real connected intimate time with Jesus is the very thing that grows our faith, it shifts our minds, it brings about revival in our souls, and it compels us to share Jesus with others, and the devil doesn't like it. But here's the thing. And this is what I was mentioning a few minutes ago. We have become such an instant society. The worst thing that was ever created in my mind was the microwave. Because what happened with the microwave is now you didn't take the time to cook, you just nuked it. And then the fast food restaurant came along. And that made things even worse because now you can just run through a drive through and grab it. Okay, now I appreciate those things because I'm not a cook. So it's easier to find leftovers or to find one of the microwavable dinners and pop it in and hit two minutes and have dinner two minutes later. Okay? I, I get all of the convenience of it. But what has happened is we have learned through all of the technology that we have we have learned that we can't be still. We're constantly having to... Let me ask you this. When you're watching a television program and the advertisement comes on, I love DVR because I haven't watched a commercial in years. I hate them. I don't hate them just because they're an advertisement and I don't want to buy anything. I hate them because I got to wait two minutes. And if you watch something online, they don't let you fast forward the commercial. So what do I do? I mute it and I pull out my phone. Because God forbid I should sit there by myself and still for two minutes. Now some of you are laughing so I know you do the same kind of thing. We have learned, it has been ingrained in us. God forbid that you don't have something going every day. God forbid that you're not running a rat's race. Because that's what we have been ingrained to think because of all of the conveniences that have been created. The microwave, the fast food, uh, you know, pay at the pump. Uh, all those kinds of conveniences. The computer was supposed to make us, when they created the computer, the term was, we can cut our work week from 40 hours to 20 because of the speed of the computer. Has that happened yet? Why? Because we can't sit still. You want to know one of the reasons, let me, let me just even go for it. Now, I'm, don't get me wrong because I'm thankful for all the, I'm glad we have A.C., I'm glad we have electricity. But do you want to know what the lack of electricity caused people to do? Go to bed at a decent hour. They sat on their porch until the sun went down. And who wants to look at the dark? Might as well go to bed at 9 so I can get up when the sun comes up at 5. But now we have electricity, so sometimes we look out the window, we think it's 9 o'clock and it's 1 in the morning. Are you getting what I'm, saying, what I'm trying to get across? Our thought process has become so sped up that we can't stop for just a moment and have that time with the Lord. I'm not talking about having a regular prayer time. I'm, that, that's something in I'm talking about in life, just unplugging and sitting back and just being with the Lord. There's a couple of reasons why I think we, we, we are afraid to do that. Uh, to get alone with God. Uh, because I, b I believe that when we're alone with God, God's going to find us out. Right? Because 
when we're alone with God, some of us are afraid that God's going to ask us to do something. And as long as our excuse can be, well, God, I don't have time to do that. Bradley mentioned it a little bit in his message. How am I going to do this thing that God's asking me to do? Okay? Sitting alone with God has a way of bringing action items to our mind that we have pushed away with the excuse of, I'm going to just be busy doing this and doing this. We fear the question of God to change us. And so behind all of that is the lie that says, I cannot face God as I am. Because all we see is our chaos and our mess and our schedules. We're, I just got to let you know we're all a mess. You may think you have it together today. You don't. And if you think you do, then I know you don't. We all need God to clean up the mess. And so here's the antidote. Running from ourselves is running to the only one who can help us get over ourselves. Running to him and away from our schedules and away from our chaos. The Bible says it this way, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. When we turn off the distractions and sit quietly, focusing on him and re really meditating on his word, scientifically, this is not preacher talk, this is a science talk, it says this, your brain will be physiologically altered. Science has proven that the brains of people who spend untold hours in prayer and meditation are different. The science tells you that your imagination will be rewired. Inappropriate thoughts can be uh, combated with positive thoughts. Science tells you that the kind of brave waves, there's five different brave wa brain waves that we have, delta, theta, alpha, beta, gamma, and they all fluctuate throughout the day. But when you sit calmly and quietly before God, the kind of brain wave that comes during relaxation and sleep. How many have struggled sleeping? You're struggling sleeping because your thoughts are... <laughs> and so when you get that alone time with God, our brain waves that process relaxation begin to move and you're able to go to sleep. I like this one. A study from UCLA found that uh, prayer and meditation makes your brain stay younger. Some of you have hope. You'll have fewer wandering thoughts. Your perspective will change. And so to close out this first session, if you're looking at that chart, your thought becomes, the lie is, I'll feel better if I stay distracted. And so I keep myself constantly distracted by constant inputs. And so my life becomes needy and frantic. And the consequence becomes I'm insecure. But if you take that same discontent and you insert that statement, I have a choice, and you choose to be still with God... Your thought, instead of saying, I'll feel better if I stay uh, distracted, becomes only being with God can satisfy me. The behavior becomes prayer and meditation instead of chaos. Your relationships become calming and reassuring instead of needy and frantic. And the consequence is you become secure. Praise God. The last thing I want to mention before we go into our break is, is this. Carnal thinking is this. Negative emotion because of. Okay? Anger because of injustice. Whatever it is. You plug in the word. Quiet time with God, we rewrite the formula of thinking and we, we take back the power that he has given us and so all of a sudden our spiritual thinking becomes this negative emotion and reason so I will choose to be with God. You see the difference? One, you stop before your choice and all of a sudden you just go haywire. But when you put the choice in there, you can go right back up and your relationship can be better. Amen. Listen, there's donuts and coffee. 
Uh, we're not going to pray because we're going to come right back here in just a few minutes. It's 9.52. We're going to go by that red clock back there. So be back in here at 10.05. So if you eat quick, drink quick, and come on back, and Trish is going to be speaking in the next session. Declan, will you find out what chair mom wants? What chair she wants? <laughs>